So the readings that we have for today, holy cow, do they cover a lot of ground. Good night. I lost an unreasonable amount of time this last week trying to figure out how tall a 50 cubit uh, gallows was. And the answer, depending on where you find it, <laughs> would be roughly 75 feet. Or for those visiting from other countries, perhaps 25 meters, if that's helpful. Um, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this. There's not a Wikipedia page on Haman's gallows, at least that is in sufficient detail that it has video footage or photos. But nonetheless, we hear this fantastic story from Esther. Now, Esther is a book in the Bible that never mentions the word God, which seems like, I mean, there's probably a long list of ways that you get your book included in the Bible, but it seems like mentioning God would be helpful. But um, apparently Esther didn't need it. Most scholars feel that Esther is a beautiful novel about the relationship between God and God's people. And for the Jewish people is the background of the celebration of Purim. And so it's a very important text that we have today in regards to the Jewish tradition. But I can't help but think about the overlay of this reading on top of our world today. This is what we do every week, right? We get a set of readings and we say, how do these readings land on us today, the 29th of September, 2024, in Palo Alto, California. What we have in the Esther story is a story of the persecution of the Jewish people who are saved by the king of Persia, or we might say it differently, the king of Iran. It doesn't feel like today's narrative. It does not feel like today's narrative. But it does speak to a long history and tradition of challenge, of how stories often do not become simpler but become more difficult. As we think about the 7th of October coming up in the not too distant future here, we're mindful that a year ago was the attack of Hamas on Israel. And then we think of the warfare that has been waged ever since And we think of how many innocent people killed, broken, often at the behest of others whose motivations we might have lots of questions about. This is a painful, difficult time in our world. And that's one region, one region. We can look at Eastern Europe. We can look at Africa. There's any number of places. In fact, an article I read a few weeks ago said that since World War II, this has been one of the more explosive periods of time in recent history. We look at the text that we have from Jesus, and we don't get a lot of comfort from it. We get characteristically in these Sundays after Pentecost, these kind of awkward readings where Jesus is seeking to teach us a lesson and we're doing, you know, various ways of listening well or not listening well. So we were talking about prayer in the children's sermon here. We think about the reading from James and the prayer life of God's people. The concerns that Jesus raises are how we interact with those who are newer in the faith. We have our Apple Fest coming up. We think of fall harvest, but we can think easily of the earliest days of the season when the plants are small and vulnerable and weak. And how might they be protected and nurtured? Jesus is concerned about those of us in the Christian community. How are we behaving? Are we behaving in a way that nurtures the new green faith of someone? Or are we acting in ways that challenge them, that perhaps make them even more vulnerable? 
It's not the simplest thing. And it's interesting to me because if you listen to the news today, and certainly over the last few generations, if you ask people what Christians are mostly concerned about, the answer is universally going to be sex. It's all Christians think about. It's our only interest. Jesus, however, doesn't seem to have really much interest in that. Jesus' interest is in how we treat those who are vulnerable and hurting. Now, the text goes on and gets really quite gruesome. It's interesting to me that just as Jesus doesn't talk about sex a whole lot, there are other phrases that are common to us as Christians that just simply don't come up in Scripture all that often. The word hell, for instance, comes up maybe a dozen times in the New Testament. It's not that common. In fact, the word that is translated as hell is the word Gehenna. It's a strange word. It's a place. We might think of hell as a place, but Gehenna is like a place, like pull out your Rand McNally of Jerusalem and, and point at it sort of thing. Gehenna was a sharp valley on the east side of Jerusalem. It's where people would throw their trash. It stank. It was often burning, right? Many times you might go out looking for something, perhaps, finding only worms and smoke. You hear about worms in the text here. This idea of what happens when we stray from God. Oh, well, do you know that burning pile outside the city? That's what happens. We get a bit of that in our text today. I think the key thing, though, as we think about what we are called to be about, James helps us with this a bit, is that we are called to be oriented towards others. Kind of in classic Latin language, there would be this sense that our original sin is being curved in on ourselves. No awareness of what's going on with our neighbor or somebody on the other side of the world being focused purely on ourselves. But instead, Jesus is calling us to be curved out, to be looking towards those who are hurting, who are grieving, those who are at the margins how we can protect, how we can nurture. This is Jesus' concern for what we are called to be about. And I think when we pray, we get that image as well. Is the story of our prayer life a list of instructions for God so that God can get God's act together? Or is it a sense of our concern for others? and silence for how we might understand God acting in our own life and God's call for us to act in different ways. Communication is hard, right? It's difficult, even when we're in the same language, but sometimes we're not. When our daughter Inger was a freshman at Cal Lutheran, living right across the hall from her was the son of Marielle's dearest friend from our Cal Lutheran years. And so it was fun that they were right across the hall. And he ended up having to help Inger a lot because she did this cool freshman year of college thing where you blow your ACL on day one of school and have to have surgery. So she had to have a lot of help getting around campus. And they would text one another. And after a while, we heard back that Eric said, Inger, you don't use emojis. I have no idea what you're saying. (laughs) This sense that we don't always get tone, right? When it's just raw text. And do we lose at times when we are hungry or tired or feeling anxious for various reasons, Luther's admonition to put the kindest construction on our neighbor's actions and words. And how does that relate to our relationship with God? Is it one way, or are we open to hearing? Are we open to listening? Are we open to being oriented towards others? 
I think the challenge for us in today's text is that God is concerned about our empathy, something that in our modern lives, it seems like we have a hard time cultivating. So I would encourage you to hear this text today as an encouragement from Christ to open our hearts towards others, that we might understand the work that they are doing, that we might support them, but we might be open to not putting all of our concerns first, but rather perhaps looking at the concerns of those who are hurting first. Amen. Please stand as you are able. <clears throat> 